Okay guys, so it's been over a week since I've made any content. I've got seven Switch games I've been going through, and I've got a lot of content coming up. To get things started, we'll go into the indie world for a rogue first-person shooter. By rogue, I mean a randomly generated dungeon crawler that just happens to be a first-person shooter. Also released on the PS Vita, with me not able to do a video review with the lack of PlayStation TV support, here is my review of Paranautical Activity for the Nintendo Switch. Paranautical Activity is a rogue first-person shooting game. A shooter where you go into a dungeon where everything is randomly generated, from the rooms and enemies to the items and weapons. Now to get this out of the way, there is nothing new about this version of Paranautical Activity, outside of the fact that the Switch version can be played on the go and on the TV, which is unique to this version because as I said in the intro, the developers did not enable PlayStation TV support for the PS Vita version of this game. And moving forward in this review, you should expect me to compare this version to the Vita version in a few different ways. Because in essence, this review is going to be a comparison to show which version handheld fans should get. The basic gist of Paranautical Activity is pretty simple. You choose your character and loadout, and you spawn in an 8 floor dungeon. Your goal is to navigate through rooms and enemies until you find a boss, take down the boss, and then take an elevator to the next floor, repeating the process until all 8 floors are cleared and you beat the game. Of course, it's easier said than done. This is a rogue first person shooter. So a lot of elements from other rogue games like The Binding of Isaac are in play here. First of all, there are no checkpoints or save points. You do a run and your run takes you through the entire game. If you die, you restart from floor one, just like when you die in a run of The Binding of Isaac in similar games. The other factor is the fact that this is all randomly generated. While the dungeons will look very, very similar each time you play the game, what's in each room of the dungeon, what enemies you fight, what bosses you fight on each floor, whether you get item shops or not, what items are in those item shops, all of this is randomized, meant to create a big sense of variety as you play through the game and die and replay it and die again and replay it again. And that also ties into the game's difficulty. Rogue games are not known for being easy games, and 3D rogue games are no exception. All enemies and bosses in this game do have patterns that you can learn and dodge around, but that doesn't mean it's easy to learn them, especially when everything is randomized and you go into a room not knowing what you're going to fight, where they're going to spawn, and where they're hiding. This is a very difficult game, even for veterans. Although I played Paranautical Activity on the PlayStation Vita for hours upon hours, it only took about 10 minutes on the Switch for the game to start beating me up and giving me deaths on just the first floor. And this is where my main problem with Paranautical Activity lies. I don't have a problem with the difficulty. I've never really gotten frustrated when I die in Paranautical Activity. The problem more lies in the lack of variety in enemy types that they give you, or at least the placement of that variety. The game has about a dozen different enemy types and a dozen different boss types, but they're not spread out very well as you replay the game over and over and over again. Now with normal enemies, it's just a matter of them not placing them spread out well enough, especially when you're still not very good at the game and are stuck on floors 1 through 3 for most of your runs. Bosses are a little different, because about half of the bosses are unlocked through in-game achievements that are tied to actually progressing through a bunch of the floors of the game. If you get stuck on floors 1, 2, and 3 for a long time, you'll only really have about 5 or 6 bosses to choose from, which makes it even easier for each run of the game to have the same bosses. This lack of variety and lack of good placement makes this randomly generated game feel not so random. Of course, this in-game achievement system isn't all bad. It actually helps the game quite a lot in terms of longevity. As you play through the game and go through various runs, you'll unlock all of these achievements, most of the time not even knowing that you're doing what you need to do. And all of these achievements have in-game rewards. Some of them unlock new character loadouts and new game modes to go through. 
while others add new elements to future runs, like new items, new weapons, and new bosses. In other words, as long as you keep going through these dozens of achievements, you're constantly unlocking new content for future runs of the game. Well, this isn't really a control thing. Another thing I don't like about the game is the fact that nothing's explained to you. You pick your loadout and you're just kind of thrown in this area with no explanation. You don't know that your goal is to go through and find a boss so you can go to the next floor. And this is a problem, especially in a genre that's known for being so difficult. And the fact that some other games of the genre do kind of hint you towards what you're supposed to do. Now, presentation is where this comparison really starts to shine. The PlayStation Vita version had a lot of problems maintaining a steady 30 frames per second. It had dips almost constantly down into the 20s, making it a playable but rough experience. Thankfully, the Switch version has a perfect frame rate, whether you're in handheld mode or docked mode. The only thing I don't like about presentation is that every time you go into the room, the game just kind of stops and freeze loads for a second as it loads up everything in the room instead of things being seamless. Of course, this isn't a problem just with the Switch version. Even the PlayStation 4 version of the game does this, but it's still a bit of an annoyance as you're trying to run and gun through this dungeon and the game constantly just stops you in your tracks as it freezes the game to load up the characters from the next room. Now let's talk about battery life, which is pretty nice. I expected as much given the pixel design of the graphics, but here are my times from 100% to 0%. Maximum brightness with the Wi-Fi on, 3 hours and 28 minutes. Maximum brightness with the Wi-Fi off, 3 hours and 36 minutes. Lower brightness with the Wi-Fi on, 4 hours and 9 minutes. Lower brightness with the Wi-Fi off, 4 hours and 17 minutes. So that's a pretty good amount of battery life. Now in conclusion, Paranautical Activity isn't a perfect game. It's got flaws, like the freeze loading when you're entering a room and the lack of explanation, but it's definitely improved upon the PlayStation Vita version. Costing a little less money than the PlayStation Vita version, having a much smoother and stable frame rate, and having the capabilities of, be of being played on the go and on the TV, this is definitely the version that handheld gamers will want to go with. Reviews to Go rates Paranautical Activity for the Nintendo Switch a 7.5 out of 10. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to leave them below or head to the website at www.reviewstogo.com.